My name is Eric Lopresti, and I want to thank the um, Stevens Institute of Technology for hosting the Civil Defense Workshop, and of course the Carnegie Corporation for underwriting my sub-award, which is um, an art project called Center Surround. You can see this in the room down the hall, and there's also a second screen kind of out the atrium. Um, and I want to start just by talking about I I um, look at a lot of work relative to this subject, and I think a lot about what it means to have be an artist who paints nuclear weapons. One thing that makes Center Surround a little different is I really make sure I don't come from a place of fear. I feel like that's very much captured in most of the cultural artifacts around this topic. You can look at Hollywood and you can find reactions to nuclear weapons that are generally very inappropriately uh, terrifying. Uh, my job is to go one step further. Um, I think nuclear weapons either, we generally view them as an enemy to be fought or a disaster to be survived. I would say, from my point of view, both of those tend to separate me from this subject matter. They put a barrier, sort of an otherness to the, the subject. But in fact, I'm inextricably linked into the society and the technology. I grew up in a nuclear town. I'll tell you a little bit about it. And I wanted to make a piece that talked about observing the facts on the ground, kind of what is, what, what actually is there, and then use that to sort of build my own response beyond, uh, as I mentioned, broad terror. So, Center Surround is a video project with three channels. There are two of them in the side room and one of them in the atrium. And um, I'm gonna play a little bit for a second, but it started off as a two channel and now with the uh, some defense grant, it went to a three channel. Um, on the left, there is a channel that shows martial artists uh, doing something called Aikido. Aikido is a Japanese martial art and they are uh, throwing each other to the ground somewhat violently but with care uh, without injury as in the middle channel um, a color display counts off every nuclear explosion in history this is a very educated audience so quick show of hands who knows how many uh, nuclear weapons have been exploded in history <laughs> alex is excluded all right um, i'm just going to do this as a poll uh, over a hundred, right? Okay, over a thousand, over ten thousand. All right, somewhere between there. How about two thousand four hundred and seventy-four? That's the number we came up with, which is higher than a lot of the list. <laughs> All right. The truth is, this is actually kind of an important number. Every one of these weapons could destroy a city, and there's been two thousand four hundred and seventy-four of them. That is a massive uh, thing to take in, and I wanted to do an artwork that counted them off so that I could sort of viscerally understand that, not just intellectually, but kind of feel it. So, as I mentioned, in the middle channel, it's counting off every single weapon, and um, the top number, that's not the number, that's actually the, the name of the test. Some of the tests are named the numbers, but here's a test that is named with a name, that's a French test probably. And, the date, and then on the right side, every single one of those weapons is represented as a square in this accumulation grid. The entire piece takes about uh, two hours. And I'm just gonna play a little bit of this uh, so you can sort of get the feel why I talk over it. Uh, you'll notice I have a different number on the screen. That's because for uh, this week, uh, I had a different number of mine. Alex, with his research, found that we actually undercounted. If you can hear, every time someone's thrown, there's this like slapping noise on the ground. That's a way of taking a, a fall, potentially lethal fall, in a non-lethal, safer way. It's called a fall. And that sound reminded <coughs> me of the sound of like a sped up nuclear explosion. And so I paired these two things together in sort of a, a diptych, or now a triptych, that attempts to sort of humanize this vast subject. It's very hard to get your mind around a concept as big as nuclear weapons. And I wanted to make it visceral, and I also wanted it to be involved. So I'm actually on the mat, 
can see me probably taking the ball. Um, did survive without injuries, but it's painful, it's effortful, and I wanted that cathartic experience. And it's like the endurance piece. This is a two, uh, two hour video, um, took longer than that to film, and um, I'll talk a little bit about how that came about. So I'm not usually uh, a video um, uh, artist. I'm usually a painter. This is me in my studio in Brooklyn. And I paint a, a lot of deserts. Some of you in this audience will recognize that painting on the right as um, it's an oil on canvas. And this is a painting of an underground nuclear explosion in Nevada test site. So what you're actually seeing is not the explosion itself, which happens un deep underground. But the um, aftermath, as the ground sinks, subsidize, subsidizes, and um, dust is kind of coming out of it. I would submit this is a better way to think about nuclear weapons than a uh, mushroom cloud. The mushroom cloud is an iconic image that's used in our culture, but it's also a bit of a caricature. It's kind of easy to dismiss as sort of a pop reference to disaster. Um, of course, no one wants to see one of those over their cities. Uh, unless you're um, using one of Alice's tools. But I'm more interested in, the, you know, sort of like how these things actually work. And if you think about the tests in North Korea, there's not even this. So nuclear weapons are one of those very strange things, which is both omnipresent everywhere and also sort of impossible to visualize uh, in a concrete way because most of it happens invisibly. Here are more craters from Nevada Test Site. These, these paintings, by the way, are um, watercolors on paper. They're slightly smaller than this, so still pretty large. I show my work here in New York. I show my work um, internationally. And I don't always paint just nuclear weapons, so this is a more recent painting of rocks and tape. That's sort of a desert cactus with some colorful uh, tropoloid tape marks on the top. And that's showing at my gallery, Morning of Modern Chelsea, here in New York. Please come by. It's a writer named Otto. I did grow up in a nuclear town. This is Eastern Washington State. Um, okay. The Hanford, the Hanford <laughs> Nuclear Site. Some people know. I grew up in um, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like talking to people who know this topic. It's very, um, it's interesting as an artist because most people, especially most people in the East, just really don't know this sort of landscape. Um, it is a little unique to grow up there, there lots of green soccer fields, and then there's the Hanford site where they made the plutonium for the Nagasaki bomb, and also all the stuff that was in those nukes that went down to Nevada test site and um, created those craters we saw just a minute ago. So here's an image of Nevada test site. This is an example of um, the apocalyptic sublime. So in the tradition of representing American <clears throat> landscapes is wide open. This is a landscape which is wide open but also overlaid with technology, and the technology of the nuclear weapons. This is where the U.S. Uh, blew up something around 900 of that 2474 uh, 4, bombs before we blew off here. You can find this on Google Earth. I highly recommend doing so. Um, this is a diagram, and you can see every one of those circles is. I also find the desert very beautiful. Um, there's something just sort of transcendent about the bleakness of it for me. It's a place of testing. It's a place of psychological isolation. Um, that's the Columbia River. When I was 21 years old, I had a near lethal bike accident in the middle of the desert. Um, my hometown does look like that <laughs> as places. Um, but I found myself looking up at the sun and, and uh, just ridden my mountain bike off of a ledge. It was uh, fast bleeding out, there was no one around. There's something um, about that experience that really resonated with me on an aesthetic level because, of course, I, I didn't want to die yet, but I also was aware that I was under this crystal blue sky with this unbelievable um, uh, sort of panorama of nature and a real contact with reality. Like, um, if you've ever gone through a near-death experience, you know it changes the way you look at something. And it really changed the way I think about this subject. 
around the same time, I started doing a martial art called Aikido. Um, there's uh, some Japanese people in the audience, so um, Aikido grew up around post World War II Japan. Uh, it comes out of a long Budo tradition, that is sort of a samurai tradition, but it coalesced around 1944, 1945, and it did transform with the dropping of the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. Before the war, the founder of Aikido described it as sort of the most lethal martial art. It's the most sophisticated, it's a combination of all that it came to it for it. One strike from Aikido could kill. After the war, it became the way of harmony. Um, Aikido means way of harmony, and it's premised on the idea that you should think, endeavor to engage in conflict resolution without defeating your enemy, right? Because if you defeat your enemy, they're just going to come back for another round. This is a unique way to look at conflict, and uh, this is myself and some of my friends uh, at New York Aikikai just across the river. And it brought me into this, um, this long practice of what is conflict? How do I maintain my integrity? Um, we do learn to make these falls, so that's my friend uh, taking a break fall. It's a safe way to take what could be a pretty damaging throw. Um, and that rolled into center surround. So I want to talk a minute about what it means to engage with a topic this big. What could artists possibly have to say we have strategists, we have physicists, we have engineers, we have politicians, people who you know, know this topic from a technical point of view. And so what can I as an artist really add? For that matter, what can any of us as just civilians talk about like, that will have any sort of impact on this sort of subject? It's so huge. The philosopher Timothy Morton talks about nuclear weapons as a kind of hyper object. A hyper object is something so large you can't think about it. And yet, if you would imagine a world without it, it would be a vastly different world. So another example of this sort of, um, of idea is global warming. It's just so big, it's everywhere, it's also nowhere, I can't really do anything about it. It's also an existential threat. What do I do as an individual about that? And I think for, for me as an artist, um, painting has led me to really think about, well, let's, let's talk about what it means to observe something and to accept it in the world. Not because I want it there, but because it exists. And each one of these 2,000 plus bombs existed and happened. With, for a reason, with very smart people, for some reason, pursuing this path of lunacy. Um, and again, I want to return back to this image of an underground nuclear crater. That's possibly a better way to think about nuclear weapons. If they're invisible, we should get used to thinking about things that are and we don't need that, that cartoon to guide us or misguide us. Uh, and we also need to think about how we approach it. Right. Probably close to time, so I'm just going to do a quick run through process. Um, my original pro proposal to RCD. All my projects start on this level of thumbnail sketches. And that led to um, some storyboarding. I had never made a video, by the way. Um, Literally my first one, and I decided to make a two plus hour video that involved live action and uh, stunts. So this is um, my team, uh, my producer Phil Capello, um, Tom Piper, camera, Jamie Khan on camera, a bunch of other people who helped me out with this. Uh, I enlisted a bunch of people from New York Nike and also Lynn Kino. And we um, shot this in a uh, martial arts dojo in The GoPro image, this is a GoPro that I tapped to the ceiling. That bird's eye view, that omniscient view, is something I would occur, I return to in my paintings. It gives you a perspective. It's a little bit inhuman, but it also gives you a really wide view. And that's kind of why I like it. It's the same image that NSA uses for its satellite markups, and it's also the image that I, um, I think sort of captures like a global um, it was a lot of fun, got my friends Sam throwing me. Gathering the data was also a lot of fun. One thing about this subject is that as far as widely studied as this is, there is no authoritative list of every nuclear explosion in history. 
that concept blows my mind. So Alex and I are collaborating to put that list together and make it public. It's one of those things we should have. And finally, the programming for the grid where every grid appears these, um, these bombs. And I'll um, leave you with uh, this image, which is, um, this piece has been installed several places in New Mexico State University, where it's part of a solo show of mine called um, Super Bloom, as well as at Friedman Gallery here in the city, part of the New Year Festival last year. The sort of spirit that I found, I got from viewers who would sit and watch, in this case, there were martial arts mats that I put there, so people would sit down on the floor, and I would you to go to the other room and take a little time. It's nice and cool in there, there's lots of space, you can meditate, and that's that's sort of the feeling that people would tell me they got. It was how to meditate. It, it's beautiful, and then they learn a little bit about what the numbers mean. It's dark, um, and there's sort of a <coughs> shudder as you realize what sort of concept we're talking about. But there wasn't that fear. There wasn't a, 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 a knee-jerk terror. And there's an ability, I think, from there to have more contemplative approach to this topic. We're not going to make these things necessarily go away overnight. Neither are we going to be able to solve global warming, cyber warfare, or bio warfare, or any other of the X threats that we face. So, I would submit that getting rid of the fear and thinking a little bit more about what this means in perspective is, uh, is one contribution.